this lovely girl at the window from Dulwich. Yeah. Um, and first of all, do you want to say something about the picture that you chose? Yeah, it's a girl looking out at a window. And of course, she's been framed by the painter. But the book is very, very much a female gaze at a man. And so this is looking back. I was I was seeing a lot of um, a very good friend of mine, um, Joe Shapcott at the time, and a lot of her poetry is about looking back. A quark talks back to the scientist. And this is the female gaze looking back at the male. And that's really what, what the book's sort of <coughs> template is. That wonderful opening poem, Icicles Round a Tree in Dumfriesshire. I mean, I don't know whether you feel you could read that. Um, okay, so it'll take a bit of time. It does, <laughs> but I think it, it's worth hearing. <laughs> You know, when I when I won the um, <clears throat> when I won the national poetry competition, um, I was rung up by a journalist who wanted to talk about it. He said, "I hear you've written a poem called Bicycles Round a Tree in Dumfriesshire." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh well, I'll write that one next." You know. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Icicles Round a Tree in Dumfriesshire. We are talking different kinds of vulnerability here. These icicles aren't going to last forever, suspended in the ultraviolet rays of a Dumfries sun. But here they hang, a frozen whirligig of lightning. And the famous American sculptor who scrambles the world with his tripod for strangeness au naturel got sunset to fill them. It's not comfortable. A double helix of opalescent fire wrapping round you, swishing your bark down cotton you can't see, on which a sculptor planned his icicles. Working all day for that Mesopotamian magic of last light before the dark in a suspended helter-skelter, lit by almost horizontal rays making a mist carousel from the house of diamond, a spiral of pepsodent, darkening to the shadow frost of cedars at the great gate of Kiev. Why it makes me think of opening the door to you, I can't imagine. No one could be less of an icicle. But there it is having put me down in felt tip in the mystical appointment book, you shoot that quick inquiry glance, head tilted when I open up. Like coming in's another country, a country you want but have to get used to, hot from your bal masque, making sure that what you found before is still here, a spiral of touch and go, lightning, licking a tree, imagining itself Aretha Franklin singing, you make me feel like a natural woman in basso profondo, firing the bark with its other world ice, the way you fire, lifting me off my own floor, legs furled round your trunk as that tree goes up at an angle inside the lightning, roots in the orange and silver of Dumfries. Now I'm the lightning, now you, you are, as you pour yourself round me entirely. No who's doing what and to who, just a tangle of spiral and tree. You might wonder about sculptors who come all this way to make a mad thing that won't last. You know how it is. You spend a day, a whole life, then the light's gone. You walk away to the Galloway Paradise Hotel. Pine logs, cutlery, champagne. Okay, but the important thing was making it. Ours, and you don't know how it'll be. Then something like light arrives last moment, at speed reckoned only by horizons, completing, surprising, with its 300,000 kilometers per second. Still, even lightning has its moments of panic. 
You don't get icicles catching the midwinter sun and a perfect double helix in Dumfrieshire every day. And can they be good for each other, lightning and tree? It'd make anyone, wouldn't it, afraid? That Rowan would adore to sleep and wake up in your arms, but is scared of getting burnt. And the lightning might ask, touching wood, what do you want of me? Now we're in the same atomic chain. What can the tree say? Being the center of all that you are to yourself, that'd be okay. Being my own body's fine, but it needs yours to stay that way. No one could live forever in a suspended gleam on the edge as if sky might tear any minute or not forever for long. Those icicles won't be surprise anymore. The little snapped threads blew away. Glamour left that hill in Dumfries. The sculptor went off with his black equipment, adzes, twine, leather gloves. What's left is a photo of a completely solitary site in a book anyone might open. And whether our touch at the door gets forgotten or turned into other sights, light, form, I hope you will be truthful to me, at least as truthful as lightning skinning a tree. Thank you. I think I think that range, you know, from pepsodent to natural born woman to, you know, the, this atomic chain of the science, which we, we know you're so comfortable with as, as a subject. Um, this whole world, which we are promised from the opening uh, poem. Um, can you say something about the impulse with which you wrote this book? Did it come in one, in sort of one gush, or was it something that was a narration of, a, of, 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 an, of an experience or an imagined experience. It was a narration. It was a sort of narrative of, of, a, of a relationship. Um, and I think I'd started it before that, that poem and that poem came probably in the middle and then I put it at the beginning and especially after, because it was, it's such a flamboyant beginning. Um, and it was, but it's also, although, you know, it's it's an erotic relationship and it's and it's very much about love and um, and it's a woman's gaze at a man in a relationship, but it's also about art. And I realized that more and more that, you know, because that was well, 1997, I wrote that, um, you know, so that's some 20, more than 20 years ago. And I think since then I've been more and more conscious that a lot of, a lot of it is about art. A lot of what I write about has got art as one sub theme, a buried theme. And I didn't, you know, it was about, and I saw a photograph of an Andy Goldsworthy worthy sculpture um, in, in a newspaper. And um, I didn't know then um, much about Andy Goldsworthy and I didn't look him up or anything. I assumed he was um, American because I'd seen some books of his set in, in the American desert. And I only later realized that actually he lives in Scotland anyway. Um, so I wrote to him, I said, I hope you don't mind, I've written this poem about one of your pieces. And he was very sweet and wrote back and said he's delighted and so on. Sent me a Christmas card with another icicle sculpture on it. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I was so interested in, it was a sort of, it was thinking about the making of a poem. And I do think that at some level, every good poem is also at some deep level, about its own making yes uh, not not a not a, it's not an important thing of the about um as it were but it's there and um and so i was interested in andy goldsworth's process of um you know he does something to nature to a tree and then he waits for nature to do something and to react to it in this case four icicles round the bend and then he takes a photograph of it. So it's a very compound and complex process. 
Um, and I was thinking about that, I suppose, in, in terms of how you make a poem and how you see something and think about it and then as and, it were, it, just, and experience it because there's that truth that you yeah. land on. Yes. Um, and, and again, it's this, uh, we've seen it before, here we've got lightning, before we've had a machete, you know, it's this willingness to be cleft, isn't it? Um, and to bear the impact of whatever is coming in. I mean, do you know what comes in or you wait for it? Um... Yes, I'm not sure about cleft because, because the, the tree isn't harmed. Um, you know, there's no machete on the tree. Um, you know, it's, it's a question of natural process. Um, and the and the natural process of feeling as well as the natural process of making. Yeah. Um, I'd love to just spend an hour or more talking about Rembrandt, but um, I'll put it aside for now. And I just obviously think that nothing we've done together has scratched the surface. But I'd like to look at grammar now and history and look at uh, Whom the Gods Destroy, which is got a fabulous fly leaf here yeah. in Iceland. Yeah. Um, and it's another area of your expertise which clearly feeds your work. And I, I'm sort of hovering around page 23, have you, if you've got it handy. Um, and this really interesting um, discussion on uh, deponent verbs and active forms and the different ways in which they influence ideas of madness or lo loss, of, loss of control. And, and of course, this is all in the classical context. I mean, this is, um, I mean, you were a um, classical scholar before you were um, a poet. Um, would you be, would you sort of have a look yourself around page 23? Uh, towards the bottom of the page. I mean, is there any way you can address this issue of grammar and, and how you um, present to us this possibility of grammar um, in relation to madness and how the classics approach? Grammar in relation to madness, yeah. Well, um, I mean, the argument of the book really is that um, we think of madness as something in a human being, in the mind, um, formed um, probably from past experience and something inside and interior and, and unique to that individual. The classical Greeks thought of madness as um, something which you can see in action in a person. So the, the madness is actually in the act and it is not, and it may be some, maybe a visitation, it may suddenly come upon um, somebody and make them do something. And it is not sort of innate in them in the way that we imagine it to be innate. Nor the emotions, I think you argue, are sort of... Um, in that, the this book actually sort of follows on from this book, In and Out of the Mind. And this is the sort of formative book, which came out a few years earlier than that. And it was my PhD thesis. And um, I argue in that, that um, the ancient Greeks had a sort of double motivation, that they thought of the gods as the prime motivators of human beings and what people do. But then also the emotions were like diamonds or gods. They attacked you from outside. And they, you know, so all the metaphors of emotion, the imagery of emotion, which European languages have by and large inherited, are things attacking us from the outside. They bite us or gnaw us or pour or flood us or something. Um, there was another pulse, which was something arising from within us. Um, and so there's a sort of double thing there because of course humans, from Homer on, human beings are also treated as, as um, <clears throat> creatures who are responsible for their own actions. And so they have to, and, and for their own feelings. So there's a sort of double thing constantly. And actually, that's a quite good way of operating. It's a quite good way to uh, structure how you understand operating, because um, 
a human operations or motivation or feeling, because of course we're conflicted <clears throat> and that the multiple gods um, are very, very useful when it comes to understanding human conflictedness, um, you know, as in the double bind, going back to madness. Um, you know, there, there was a famous, um, uh, famous sort of mid mid 20th century understanding of schizophrenia as caused by uh, caused by a parent figure who places the infant in a double bind so that they might say <clears throat> go on make the floor dirty at the same time as saying i will hate you if you make the floor dirty so what can the child do that on the one hand the parent is good on the one and telling him what to do on the other hand the parent is bad and punitive so um, he will split reality. And that's very similar to the way that some of the mad figures in tragedy, like Orestes, um, for instance, go quote, quote, go mad. They have to, they are told by one set of gods that they have, he has to kill his mother because she killed his father. On the other hand, then he is punished by the Furies for killing his mother. So, so reality is and the gods are conflicted as human beings are conflicted. And I think it's a very, you know, I mean, this, this way of understanding human and divine motivation lasted for over 2000 years. It was, a, um, it, it was a structure that supported people. It made them able to look at what they'd done and then cleanse themselves of it, of a murder, for example, or guilt um, and um, explain what happened, but keep their sense of self-esteem. It's also very difficult um, to do something which we try to do as poets, which is to hold contradiction, isn't it? Yeah, yes. And, and this mean, arguably a way, um, all religion is a way of, of um, negotiating our own ambivalence. Uh, you know, what is good and what is bad? What is the origin of evil? You know, in Christian or Judeo-Christian things, is, has God put evil in the world? Why is the suffering in the world, etc. Et Hardening of the heart you, you talk about. Yeah. And obviously, it's a concept I'm very familiar with. Passover's coming up, so although yeah, this is right. this not air at that point. Um, but, but there is the other um, issue as poets that we don't want to produce something which fails to maintain nuance and which fails to maintain these balancing possibilities. How's the transition to today's um you know to what say what you do how's it how, how does it go um, how much are we influenced how have we influenced well we there's a lot of there's a lot of internal stuff i mean freud made a huge difference so a hundred years of freud um have you know and debased freud at that um you know people not really understanding freud and and so on have meant that that the the sense of of guilt is within us everything is within us we think of everything as within us i think now in the in this time when when um when so many bad things are happening so many bad events are, are being done to us um i think maybe that's shifting a bit but of course we live now with this permanent guilt of knowledge that we have debased and polluted the environment we live in. Well, that's right. We're, we're, going to, we're going to move to conservation and biology, but before we do, I mean, there's so much um, to say about history and religion. Um, I mean, is there a part of this book or the other, or the, the first book? Because I didn't, couldn't get hold of oh. um, In and Out of the Mind. I mean, I, I will get it. Well, it's on one of my lists. Um, but uh, is there a part of either in and out of the mind or whom gods destroy that you particularly um, would like to read? Or um, I think I think um, the passage that that um, is perhaps most important is is the last chapter of of in and out of the mind, which is called Blood in the Mind, and it's about. Um, the Iranias, the Furies, I uh, mentioned Orestes, who is told by Apollo to kill his mother and then is punished by the Iranias, the Furies, for, for, for killing her. Um, and and if this is to do with, with drama as well as poetry, it's to Aeschylus wrote in 464 BC, BC the, um, 
the Oresteia, the, the Oresteia trilogy. And um, he had a sort of huge um, dramatic coup, really, because he brought the Irinues onto the stage and nobody had done this before. The Irinues are, in a way, they embodied the token demon of tragedy. When a Greek vase painter wants to show um, a Greek tragedy, the, the scene that they're doing is not just any old mythological scene, but a scene on a, in, a, in a tragedy. He might do a little um, box of, of sort of a temple um, so you see that it's a sort of structure, stage structure. Um, but he will also very often show the Erinues, uh, the Furies. Um, they, in, the, they inhabit, they inhabit human relationships, really, whether with your siblings or your parents, any relationship where jealousy may lurk, where com competition and resentment may work. And they are, as it, in a way, the embodiment of curses. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Greek stage, the fifth century Greek stage had a, a sort of pit when they could arise, that there was some sort of stage with a trap door in it and the Iranians could rise from the ground. Um, and I, I, I um, uh, I have a quotation here from George Steiner, a note on absolute tragedy. Absolute tragedy makes implicit or explicit the intuition that there can be no reparation. Each absolute tragedy reenacts the mystery and the outrage of innate evil, of a compulsion towards blindness and self-destruction in men and women. Um, and so the tra in tragedy, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, where do I? Take your time because we can always cut. Yeah. So, you know, tragedy explores damage within bonded relationships that is worked out by the Irinus, the fury, the demon of the lasting reality of remembered hurt, of self of self-destructive self awareness of the other's anger. Um, anger and Irinues belong together. Um, so Irinues express a perception of the world in which conflicting relationships are at work in the self. Irinus may punish you for punishing an act that other Irinues might themselves have punished. Um, and it's a sense of the underworld, the underground anger, which is, of course, the unconscious, the inner sense of a person, as well as the underground, the underworld, suited the fifth century theater's awareness of its own underground, um, with some sort of underground channel through which an actor playing a ghost might crawl up. Unseen underground space where the dead lie in resentment was pre present in tragic language and tragic staging. It was a truth, both of the stage and of relationships in tragic family and society, that something might rise from below at any moment. Tragedy insists on the irrevocableness of action and word, the power for lasting damage that inheres in one act, performed or uttered under an entirely impermanent passion. Even though, and this is one of tragedy's cruelest revelations, that passion may not actually belong to that person and may never visit them again. Um, this sense of damage through words and an answering violence snapping back from underground is the Furies, the Iranian province in human lives and minds. Yes, I love this line in, um, again, from um, Whom Gods Destroy, um, from this, um, what the Athenians, how the Athenians would have heard, a hymn without lyre, the song of Iranius, withering mortals, binding their minds. I mean, it's the absence of music, isn't it? Yes, it's their music is there. Evoking of him, yeah. and yet at the same time, it being a, a non musical, um, and not even cacophonous, is it? Because it's using the metric. Mm, yeah, it's, it's a song. Mm. But of course, you could have, and, and there were sort of curses, 
curses were very important and curses were spells. Um, so it's the, 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 the bad music, I suppose. <laughs> and you, you come back to, um, that we come back to something you said earlier um, about, you know, when you have meter and it's being repeated, uh, but different words are being used. Um, it makes the thing that's being said feel true. Yeah. yeah. And um, here you have this, uh, the supreme example of it, um, the power of these Iranians. Look, thank you. I mean, it's slightly rarefied to have this discussion perhaps in a general poetry uh, uh, interview, but I just had to touch on it and to recommend well, for me, whom God's destroyed, but I'm looking forward to um, in and out of the mind. Um, because, I mean, would you say, how would you say your work is informed by your classical? Yes, uh, completely. My work. It is, isn't it? Yes. Could you give us an example? Yes, my work is completely informed by, by the classical work. I mean, I did, I spent 20 years on my PhD in writing those two books, In and Out of the Mind and Whom Gods Destroy. And I think the what I was focusing on was all of tragedy and Homer, of course, which lies behind tragedy and Greek lyric. Um, the, the sort of network of, of imagery and metaphor for emotion. <clears throat> um, and I also worked on Greek medicine. I had no idea what I was going to go on to do, but I spent a lot of time on the history of medicine, the history of science, and um, <clears throat> I found the same balance that Greek doctors um, attributed disease to external, mainly to external sources, what they call the esionta, the things coming in, but also to things within us that flower up from within, express themselves outwards. So there's the same pattern of explanation for disease that there is for emotion. Um, and so I suppose a lot of the work I've done on science has come out of that. And um, in, um, in poetry, I think, I mean, I, I, can I read a Beethoven poem suddenly? Yes, yes, I, f I feel very strongly that we could go back to any, I wanted to actually have Beethoven playing as you came in today. <laughs> you know, well, something oh. about so this is about Vienna because I, when I went to Vienna, um, what page can I ask you? Approach twenty-five. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so when I, when, I, when I went to Vienna, um, I'd been there once before, and my father was a psychoanalyst. So the time I'd been there before was um, when there was a sort of psychoanalytic conference. Uh, um, at which Anna Freud was. So I actually met Anna Freud and shook her hand. You know, I was very young. I didn't know how important this was. And this was the first time that she had come back to Vienna since she left with her father just before the, under the Nazis. She'd actually, Freud thought that they wouldn't touch him. And then when his Anna, his daughter was, was actually, um, you know, interrogated for a whole day, he, he got the wind up and he accepted people's help to get out. But, you know, some of his sisters died in the camps. And this was the first time that Anna Freud had come back. Two of his, is it two of his sisters mm. died? Yeah. Um, where were they? Do you know where they died? I, you, 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 I think. Oh. And, um, but I was, you know, I was very struck by um, the sense that here's this very imperial city. I mean, it is such a graceful, be over beautiful city in a way um, with these huge facades and palaces which Beethoven would have gone to play in and so on which his patrons owned and built um, huge wealth huge empire huge social imbalance really is what the city architecture is saying but of course it is one of the places par excellence which we think of in connection with the holocaust um, and um, so I was thinking, and, and I was, this was just at a time I was going to, I was doing this Beethoven research while, while Brexit was still coming up, but we hadn't yet, it hadn't yet been uh, finalized. And um, I was thinking about the Europe I grew up in, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, where I could go to Europe at any time. I felt European rather than British. Um, or I felt that Britain had, was and always had been part of Europe. And um, so um, 
Europe felt like my birthright um, and every British person's birthright, just as our country is birthright for anybody who can travel to it, Spanish, French, Greek, whatever. Um, and, um, and of course, going to Vienna was a place where during Be Beethoven's time, that was not true. I mean, at first he lived through two occupations of Vienna by Napoleon. Um, and, um, you know, he was very affected by it, I mean, economically, and he would see um, Austrians, mutilated veterans in the streets and all, all the rest of it. And he had a very ambivalent attitude to Vienna. Um, and then after the Conference of Vienna in 1815, um, you know, there was, there was a very sort of censorship and there was a return to um, surveillance and um, suspicion and clamping down. So, so I was thinking about all of this. So, and and um, I was thinking, now we go back to in and out of the mind and the furies. And I was thinking of anti-Semitism, anti-otherism of every kind as something which is kind of like the monster underground, like the, the Minotaur in the labyrinth and something that creeps up from underneath in every society. I mean, now, now in, since 2016, we've seen it in so many different societies coming out into the open, this sort of monster really in the heart. City of music. Oh yeah, and that was, I was also so, so, um, so ironic that music, which is sort of about harmony, an image of social harmony, as it always has been since Plato's philosophy onwards or before, um, is, you know, it's the city of music. It was par excellence, the city of music for, for Beethoven. That's why he's longing to go there. That's where Mozart lived and Haydn. And, um, um, so then we have the city of music, but also, I mean, I, I was a great friend of George Steiner and, you know, it was one of his great early intuitions that you can have exquisite um, artistry and exquisite understanding, aesthetic understanding of music in particular, but still, but still be cruel. And so, you know, the, the story of the Schubert playing while, while the um, cattle cars were unlo unloaded at Auschwitz was, is just a sort of the epitome of that. Um, yeah, city of music. And I've got an epigraph from the third man in this, go careful in Vienna. Everyone ought to go careful in a city like this. I recognize it and I don't. We all bring our own baggage to the city Beethoven raced back to, tipping the coachman, the galloping through armies mustering for war. City of cover-up, selfie sticks, an autumn light that sparkles on the pavement. Through a cafe door, I hear the third man's zither, conjuring a ferris wheel, an iron curtain coming down. I lived here years ago on a German course that didn't take. When my dad visited for a psychoanalytic conference, we met Anna Freud, looked into the face of ancient myth. Now I'm back for Beethoven. I shut my eyes, blot out imperial facades, imagine something lethal whiffing up between the cracks of the city where psychoanalysis had to be born that twisted thread into the labyrinth, leading to the violence at the core, inhuman at the heart of the human. In a diner where they say Beethoven once lived, we run into an office party. What of the Minotaur, the rise of the far right? You can't tell, says my friend. In the 1960s, you'd have known. Today, you can't make out who's fascist and who isn't. I think of Beethoven arriving on his own with Europe on the brink, battalions everywhere between himself and home. So one of the people I, I talked to and met again very nicely in Vienna was an ex au pair girl of mine. She'd been 16, she was Austrian. She'd come when she was 16, looked after my daughter when she was about nine. And now she was living in Vienna with her boyfriend and um, working with refugees 
on the outskirts of Vienna and she told me um, how difficult it was that although you know nominally they are given education actually the they're given an education and they often can't understand it so they are um, bumped out to lower and lower classes so they actually never get properly to learn German at all and um, then they discriminate against and so on so um, you know the, the way that a developed society can um, on paper look as if it's helping but actually not and, and there's an Thank inbuilt you. structure of just creates its own minor talk create its own yeah it's embodied yeah um, yeah.